No mai, haere mai. Welcome. I'm Bruce Munro, and with me via video link is International Relations Specialist Professor Robert Patman, and this is Global Insight. Chinese President Xi Jinping is poised to be given an unprecedented third term as the political leader of China. Xi Jinping gave an important speech at this week's Chinese Communist Party Congress. And that speech gives clues to what his ongoing leadership will mean for China and for the world. Welcome, Robert. Morning, Bruce. Can you unpack for us Xi Jinping's marathon speech? Firstly, what does it mean for China? Well, I, I think he's preparing China for another five years of his leadership. Um, he certainly managed to do that, uh, set the scene. Uh, but I think it was a speech that was uh, long on pride, on what's been achieved, but quite short on detail. Um, but interestingly, I think um, Xi was also s stressing when it comes to economic policy, the need for self-reliance. And that may be a response to the fact that the Americans are beginning to seriously uh, restrict things like um, microconductors and, and things like this, uh, other high-tech products to China. And um, that may be an indication that he wants uh, China to... He also put a big emphasis on developing what he called a world-class education uh, so that China could produce the sort of high-tech products uh, independently and not having to rely on other actors such as the United States. Um, I think these were quite big themes. Another big theme which he stressed was the need for what he called discipline and ideology, uh, the ongoing project of adapting Marxism to Chinese conditions. Uh, so I, I think it was more of the same, really. I mean, since she has been in power, um, there's been a lot more focus um, on, well, there's been a campaign against anti-corruption, but a lot more focus on discipline. Um, and the space for dissent has diminished. There was nothing in this speech which suggests that China would be opening up under his leadership. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, it was uh, quite short on detail, but I think the social and economic messages um, were... Um, quite ambitious, um, uh, need to develop Chinese education. And economically, um, he's putting the emphasis on China becoming even more self-sufficient. But nevertheless, he, he's fully aware that China's prosperity depends on interconnectedness and uh, a vibrant trade policy. Right. So on that point, what does his speech mean for the world? Um. I think more of the same. Uh, I didn't see anything in his speech which indicated policy on Taiwan or Hong Kong. Um, he, In his speech, he praised uh, the um, repressive legislation that was brought in under the new National Security Act in Hong Kong. Uh, he thought that was a patriotic move which uh, uh, stabilised the situation in Hong Kong. Of course, many people in Hong Kong and outside it see China's activities in Hong Kong as inconsistent uh, with its pledge to recognize uh, two systems, so to speak. Um, so Hong Kong will revert to full Chinese rule in 2047. I think what's upset the outside world is that Xi seems to be noticeably accelerating the timetable somewhat. Um, we've got to Taiwan. Um, uh, Xi Jinping reiterated that Taiwan was part of China, but he said he, and he used the words, uh, sincerely wanted peaceful reunification um, and would work hard at that. Um, so in a sense, there wasn't any, he, he didn't rule out the use of force to bring about unification, but I didn't detect any uh, commitment to make that happen anytime soon. So I think there was, with regard to Taiwan, Bruce, I think there was a more fo greater focus on continuity rather than change. Uh, the reiterated Chinese claim to Taiwan, but didn't offer anything new about bringing in that ab ab uh, about in the near future. Any other elements of the world? We've got Ukraine situation as well. Did 
Yeah, I, for the play? I, I felt there was some degree of caution um, with regard uh, to international developments. He said the international situation was challenging. Um, he also said China would continue to pursue multilateralism, as he called it, which is really code, I think, for resisting what he sees as the hege hegemonic, as his words, not mine, hegemonic influence of the United States. Um, but um, I, I think the situation in Ukraine is full of challenges for Xi Jinping. He stuck his neck out supporting um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, in a sense, undercut what he said were key what he says are key aspects of Chinese foreign policy, um, namely a commitment uh, to uh, territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty. Uh, he seems to have contradicted himself in this area. And it seems to me that Mr. Pu uh, Mr. Xi Jinping may become increasingly concerned as uh, Putin struggles in the Ukraine. If Putin is defeated, uh, I do not think uh, Xi's leadership will be immune from the fallout from that event happening. And so, in in, in a sense, uh, I think Xi has put himself in a position uh, which is quite vulnerable in foreign policy terms. And uh, while he's been careful to measure his support for the the regime uh, in, 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 in the Kremlin, the fact that he said the Russian invasion reflected legitimate security concerns, I think, has undermined his whole foreign policy platform to some degree because it cuts right through it. And that's got to be uh, a bit of an own goal when it comes to projecting China's global interests. So he's got to deal with that problem. We've been talking about the world. Is there anything to say specifically about what Xi Jinping's speech means for New Zealand? I, I think it will be from what we can gather from the speech, and um, we never know if there'll be external or intervening events, but from what he said, it sounds like we're in for more challenging times in New Zealand-Chinese relations. Um, uh, there was, although, as I say, it was quite self-congratulatory at times, the speech, um, it was also, I think, more of the same in many respects. And... Um, it's been pointed out that China accounts for a third of all of New Zealand's international trade, which is a huge figure. Uh, they're a number one uh, export destination for our largely agricultural products. We produce very good products, and so they're demand internationally. We are trying to diversify, and I think that effort will probably intensify. I do not buy the argument that some have said that we're wedded to China come what may. Uh, I don't think that is the case. Um, we certainly want a good relationship with China for obvious economic reasons. But um, we are, the New Zealand is making efforts to diversify. We've seen this free trade agreements in Europe with the EU and the UK. We are looking to significantly upgrade our relationship with Japan. And uh, we also have the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, and I think New Zealand is on the lookout for more opportunities generally in the Indo-Pacific. So we do have to keep up that diversification because um, if it doesn't happen, um, then China, there is always the implication that China, it may either uh, try to use its economic uh, leverage with us for political reasons, or uh, we may have no choice but to go along with Chinese positions in international affairs that we don't approve of. I, I can't really see New Zealand governments doing that. Um, as I say, it's a very important economic relationship to us, but politically and ideologically, we're not close. Thank you, Robert. Catch us next time on Global Insight. Kaki Daniel.